Karen, you, you hadn't joined yet, but I was telling Meredith how excited we were um, that we are the first ones to wish you a happy pub date <laughs> in the United States. So we won. Yeah, because you won. It is technically my publication day here in Dublin. Um, yes. We're just going to go with that. We're not going to question the time zones or the calendar too much. Nope. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So it's now technically my publication day and you're the first. <laughs> I wanted to bring a French 75 up here, but um, just as a, so just this is my virtual uh, French 75 and congratulations. So thank you yes. very much. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and, and get started here. Um, but yes, please feel free to chat away. Make sure it's to everyone. And I'm letting Allison know that guess it's now working. Okay. Um, and we probably want to be sure we wait till actually seven to start rocking and rolling, right? Just so people don't, okay, sure. we don't want people to miss any, any, anything, all the important stuff about who Catherine is and why she's so wonderful. Although anyone who listens to currently reading is like worried I'm a little obsessed. You, you oh. should be on commission, Meredith, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it really hey, is true. I only speak the truth. I only speak the truth. So what I'm going to do here, um, we actually, in my hot little hands, have um, 20 signed copies of Runtime. And I'm going to put it here. So the first 20 people who actually use that little chat box to click on it we'll get a signed copy we'll have plenty other ones but um, I, I have an unsigned one fresh off the press here because they only arrived today so, oh, it, looks so yes. good. it looks beautiful they're all just sitting there right in a row in our workroom so um yes very excited so um how have you had a good day Catherine I've watched your Instagram you had a busy day yeah, I'm having a crazy couple of weeks. So uh, today I did a lot of like bookstore signings. Tomorrow um, I have nothing to do except another one of these with um, another American bookshop at a more normal time. <laughs> 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 I, do, I don't have to stay up as late tomorrow. Um, and then the following day I have a radio thing. And then on Thursday I have my launch here in Dublin. And on Friday, I have a launch in Cork. And on Saturday, I have more bookshop stuff. And I'm also trying to finish the next book by the 1st of September or finish the first draft of it. So yeah, it's all go. <laughs> okay. Well, that's so exciting. Well, now it, it is it is seven o'clock, so we can officially begin. Yes. And um, I'm going to start by introducing our two lovely women here. And then I'm going to kind of back away. Well, you have some questions, though, Meredith. We want to talk to Catherine for a second about her backlist. But mm -hmm. um, so our, our wonderful Catherine Ryan Howard is an internationally best-selling crime writer from Cork, Ireland. Her most recent novel, 56 Days, was named a best thriller of 2021 by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Irish Times. It was an Irish number one bestseller and won Crime Novel of the Year at the Irish Book Awards. I know. <laughs> Big deal. Her previous work has been shortlisted for the Edgar Award for Best Novel and CWA's John Creasy New Blood and Ian Fleming Steel Daggers. And she's been shortlisted for the Irish Crime Novel of the Year multiple times. She currently lives in Dublin. That is very nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, tonight, Catherine, we, we decided, I, you know, when we talked about doing this, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have dear Meredith do the interview? And we could, because she really is the one who has kind of spurred all this on with so many, so many wonderful readers. And um, I wanted to hear the two of you talk. So selfishly, I was like, let's have Meredith do this so we can have a, such a fun conversation. <laughs> So uh, interviewing Catherine tonight is Meredith Monday Schwartz, co-host of the wildly popular book podcast currently reading. Meredith is a married mother of four and full-time CEO of a large wedding website. She lives in Austin, Texas and loves the amazing bookstores and diverse community that make up that gorgeous place she calls home. It's not so gorgeous right now. It's pretty hot, but <laughs> it's, we'll it's awful hot. <laughs> She's been an avid reader since she was four. Her favorite thing to do if she's not reading is, wait for it, talk about books. 
about a little over a year ago, Meredith introduced her listeners of the Currently Reading podcast to Katherine Ryan Howard. And it seems the Currently Reading Bookish podcast community can't get enough and it keeps spreading and spreading. So welcome, Catherine, and welcome, Meredith. Um, this is going to be a fantastic evening. Oh, I'm so, 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 so looking forward to it. Yeah. And you're really, you're too kind, Elizabeth. You really, you allowed me to do this to get me off your back. Just saying like, <laughs> how can I, how I know you're going to talk to her when the book comes out. How can I be involved? I was willing to just creepily peek up over Elizabeth's shoulder if I had to. <laughs> <laughs> this looks a little more official. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It does. Well, Elizabeth, before you kind of you know, let me start pestering her with questions. Mm -hmm. What is your fate before runtime? Let's pretend that we didn't get early access to it. What right. was your favorite? What's your favorite Catherine Ryan Howard novel? I'm just curious. Well, my, my favorite personally is the nothing man. It, it just takes a lot to scare me. There's only, I've only had about one or two books that have ever really scared me. So mad props for that, Catherine. And <laughs> The one that I love to sell the most, interestingly, is Distress Signals, because yeah. especially during COVID, it was like, you know, everyone was missing traveling. I'm like, you know what? It's not as great as you think it is. <laughs> so find, finding books that are um, like horrible travel stories, those sold really well for a while. Just like it's, you're, you're building it up in your head that it's so great, but really you could be murdered and no one would solve the case. You so. are, you are such an amazing bookseller that you found that, that way to sell that book. Like that just shows. Yeah. <laughs> and we have an entire shelf of our store dedicated to you. So oh. I, um, I've had people say, oh, I've, I've had, I can't find it in my indie. I'm like, oh, we have it. I'm on a first name basis with my Blackstone <laughs> publishers here because we cannot stop selling them. We have the nothing man out for our, um, books about books display. I'm like, so you've got 84 Charing Cross Road and the nothing. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so similar, those two, so similar. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to back out here. I may pop in occasionally if there's a really good question, um, but I just cannot wait to hear the two of you talk and Meredith, take it from here. All right, well, I'm going to just put in here, I'm going to be a contrarian. My favorite of all your books is actually Rewind. That's and very, I, I have to say, Meredith, that's very strange. <laughs> you think so? I just, you might be the only one. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. I love Rewind. I mean, I love all of them, but I love Rewind. And I feel like that's the book that, yes, I haven't done enough to pump people up on it because not as many people talk about it, but I love Rewind. Okay. <laughs> but we are here to talk about all of your books, but we're here to talk about runtime because as you said, it comes out tomorrow in the U.S. It's already out in the U.K. last week, right? Yeah, yeah, last Thursday. Uh, okay, so how on the eve of your publication, it, it is reminding everyone, it is one in the morning for you in Dublin. How are you a person who gets nervous about pub day in the U.S. or in the, like the big, you know, when, or do you, are you sort of like, it is what it is? I think now like six books in I'm very much it is what it is um I think like in the earlier years kind of books like one to four um I would be like having sleepless nights and like I'd be looking at advanced reviews and you know I'd be like freaking out about the kind of behind the scenes publishing stuff like you you kind of get told things like how many copies are on order and what PR you've lined up and stuff and now I really don't <laughs> <laughs> now you, you know I just you can't stress about them and like I like we can talk about this but I clearly am developing a pattern where I write two kind of serious books and then I go just completely off piste for the third one and rewind was a you know one of those and I think runtime is as well and so I know this book is going to be a bit a bit marmite as we say you know it's going to be like love it or hate it mm -hmm. but in my head I'm already on to the next book you know like because of the schedule of publishing so right. I just hope that like people enjoy it and 
I'm having fun. This is the nice bit of being an author where you're doing all your PR and stuff like that. And I just try not to worry anymore because, you know, it's about the body of work and not and not every individual book, I feel at this stage. I, I think that that's a really smart way to look at it. And I, you know, I do agree. I love that the, it's a Marmite book. I did hear you say that every couple of books, you write a book that's just for you. So I want to get into exactly how runtime fits into that category. But so where, so you mentioned in the acknowledgements that you got the inspiration for runtime, which I've read twice. I liked it so much <laughs> that you got it for, you got the inspiration when your brother was in an independent film. So how did that spur this idea? So a few years ago, my brother, John, who he says, like, we're actually just Howard. Ryan is my mother's maiden name. And I put that in there to differentiate myself from Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of Henry VIII on Google. <laughs> so then John <laughs> stole it as well. So he's John Ryan Howard. And a few years ago, he was in this Irish independent horror movie called Beyond the Woods. And uh, which he would love me to say is like on... I think it's on Amazon or something like it's it's on video on demand at the moment but we were talking about it it was anyone who's read runtime or when you come to read runtime you will realize there's a lot of similarities it was very like low budget independent and it was shot in this big like creepy house out in the middle of nowhere in the countryside in the winter mostly at night and you know John would be telling me like stuff that happened on set and one of the things he just happened to mention is that when they first arrived there they had to go to the local guard station the police station and say if someone rings you up in the middle of the night and says I hear screaming out in the woods someone's getting murdered they're not it's just us and I immediately thought well what if it is if someone getting murdered you know wouldn't a movie set be a great way to hide that now as it happened when I started actually writing the book it went off in a totally different direction but that was the genesis of it that you know he also told me a story about how uh that movie that he's in is about like a sinkhole that opens up and evil stuff comes out of it and yeah. he mentioned that like you know no one could get any mobile phone reception but if you stood in this one spot you would hear this weird noise on the phone and they were like you know is life imitating art and so all that was kind of swirling around in my head when I sat down to to write this so when did you have this idea was it like okay I need to write a book and this is swirling around or had you had this in your back pocket for a few years I normally just have one idea at a time and it's kind of like in the back of my head and then when I finish a book that kind of I give that attention and it kind of turns into a proper idea mm -hmm. but I actually like he told me that a few years ago I mean it must have been 2015 it could have been when he told me that um and I just didn't think any more of it I just put it away because I wouldn't call that an idea like I'd call that just kind of jumping off point like a seed of something mm -hmm. um and then of course during the pandemic uh I ditched a book and mm -hmm. then I wrote 56 days instead and then after that I was like okay I'm out now like I'm out <laughs> of ideas <laughs> The well is empty. It has been drained. So I like needed to find something. And I thought, you know, I know this book is not, this is not going to be a 56 days and it's not going to be a nothing man. It's not going to be serious and weighty and emotional. And, you know, I'm not sure that it's in keeping with my other books, but I want to write something fun. And I really wanted to write something fun after 56 days, which was very like heavy going. Um, and you're spending maybe eight hours reading a book, but I'm spending a year like in it the whole time working. So I wanted some kind of light relief. And I figured this is it. This is, <laughs> it's time to write the book about the horror movie. That's basically what happened. <laughs> right, right. And so that's, that harkens back to what you said in that Instagram post where you said every couple of books, I write a book, that's just for me. So you're not, when you, when you set about to write this, you weren't thinking I need to talk because between the nothing man and 56 days, there really was this build bill. And so you yeah. didn't feel like, I kind of, I wonder sometimes if authors feel like they have to top and top and top and top, which is pretty impossible to do. Yeah. And, and that's right? exactly it. Like I knew it was impossible. I knew it was impossible. Like look at Paula Hawkins after the girl on the train. Like it didn't matter what she wrote after that book. It was never going to 
top that. I think there's a reason we don't have another novel from Gillian Flynn after Gone Girl, because like, how can you possibly do that? Now, obviously I'm not in that league. Let me be clear that I'm not <laughs> thinking right. that. But like, because there was such a, a jump with 56 days and now suddenly I have all these new readers and they're, you know, they're waiting for something new to come out. Like I can't do anything except write the book that I want to write in the moment I can't be second guessing I can't try and sit down and say well you know what do people want also because I'm a fan of the Steve Jobs you know idea that people don't know what they want until you give it to them Mm -hmm. and I think it's like a fool's errand to sort of say well people loved that book so I'm going to write that book again I'm just going to change the names and you know maybe make the plot slightly different I don't want to do that either um so rather than trying to and like I I spoke to some writing friends about it and I was like you know what am I going to do because I know runtime is not going to be a 56 day like I don't know where 56 days even came out of like out of me I don't know Mm -hmm. um so I can't recreate that and a friend of mine said you have to stop thinking about like the individual book like she basically said they can't all be winners (laughs) (laughs) and she (laughs) she said like it's about the body of work and I honestly I've taken really uh, that is in my molecular makeup now that it's it's about the body of work and Mm -hmm. I have to believe that like even on you know an off day I'm still doing pretty well I'm still writing something that a lot of readers will enjoy and if it's not for everyone no book is no book is for everyone so I just have to no book is focus on that yeah And I think runtime fits really, really well in your body of work because I think it's really strong. But like you said, it isn't going to be a book that's for everyone. And I think that there are a couple of things that are either going to put it into the five-star category or the, I had a hard time getting into it. And one of those is it's got to complicate. Now, this is going to be a spoiler-free conversation. So no one needs to worry. We're not going to give anything away. I want, we want you guys to enjoy it you know, as much as, 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 you know, those of us who've read it already. So don't worry about that, but there, it is a complicated construct, but that's part of what I love about your books is that every single book, you don't know what construct you're going to give us. It's always different. And so this one, I, I feel like is the most complicated. I mean, complicated. It's, um, Multi, it's really, it's multi-layered. <laughs> it's multi-layered. Yeah. And yeah. so you had to set up kind of three separate storylines, which all come together, but there's mm-hmm. some setup that's involved. So what I kept say, saying that what I really want people to know is you got to give yourself some time to get into it because you had to have time to set it up for us. So yes. was that beginning when you came up with the idea of the, you know, sort of a three-pronged plot line, how did you think about getting us into it? Was that a concern that you had at all? Like, how am I going to make them care about all three of these different things? Yeah, well, that happened in the kind of drafting because like in the first draft of this book, so this is not a spoiler, the script for the movie is inside the novel. So the script that of the movie that they're there to film is entirely as a script inside the novel. And in the first draft, that wasn't there. There was um, an outline, which is basically like a kind of synopsis, but it's of a movie. And it turned out that was really boring to read. And, you know, just it didn't really fit into the book. And I knew I was going to have to write the script. I was just procrastinating. I was just trying to get away with it. So I knew like when my editor was like, you're going to have to write the script. I was like, I I knew that day was coming and now, now it's here. Um, so I wrote the movie, but I wrote the movie first, basically. So the movie is a Russian doll that has like another piece inside of it. And then the novel is the Russian doll that those two pieces go into. But what I would say to readers, and like I find all this fascinating because American readers are so different to UK readers and Irish readers. And, you know, there's a there's a huge difference in what readers uh, expect and what they want and what they're used to and things like that. So, you know, I can't second guess any of that. I think that if you don't want to think too much about it, you can enjoy runtime. And if you really want to like get into it 
and take on all the layers, you'll find like something extra to enjoy. But mm-hmm. you, I try to design it so that you can, it can be as complex as you want it to be basically like Mm -hmm. you can just read it and go with it and not try like like me watching inception i didn't try to figure out what was going on i was just watching the movie because i had no clue so (laughs) you know you can just sort of relax and go with it and there's a lot of humor in this book which i really enjoyed and you know there's a lot of kind of set pieces and things like that and you can just read that and enjoy that without worrying about the bigger the bigger picture if you want so right Right, because I will tell you that on a second read, on a reread, as with all, I, my theory is all of your books should be read twice because I always <laughs> find things. And with yeah. runtime, it was no different. I went back and reread it and I was like, oh, look what she, that was, <laughs> she, that was, that was right there. And I didn't even pick up, a, like, it, you know, I was just reading along. So yeah, I agree. I think the way I would describe it would be if people will pay attention fairly closely for the first 15% or the first three to four chapters, the yeah. rest of it really rock and rolls very sm- And you're not having yeah. to be, you know, like you said, you can ratchet that level of attention up, but you don't need to. Yeah. But yeah. I think if you go into it thinking that first bit is going to be, su- then I think it's a little, it's you, it's, you know, I, I wanted to have my feet under me and that first 15% <laughs> gave, gave yeah. that to me, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the way that I would describe it. And then it just coasts and it just gets so fun. And there's (laughs) so many moments where the hair on the back of my neck was standing up that kind of the feeling that you have when you're watching a horror film, although there's not a lot of, I don't, this isn't a book. This isn't a work of horror. This is not, this is not gory this is not you know any any of that but that feeling when you're watching and they're sort of going into the woods or going in you know where you're like oh my gosh something's gonna happen (laughs) I absolutely loved it there so as far as you what are U.S. readers going into this how are we going into it differently than U.K. readers what are we expecting maybe that U.K. readers are are not I mean, everything I'm going to say is like a a complete generalization. And, you know, I I think Fabled have, and currently reading have like, you know, a a special demographic of readers. But I think in general, you know, they just don't want to be... um, like challenged they they want something that is exactly like all the other books that they've read and I think that's kind of true in all publishing because if you look at the mega selling books in this genre over the last few years you know a lot of them are like homages to very famous books like Agatha Christie's and then there were none like we have a lot of you know locked room mysteries they're not particularly um unusual or complex I was really happy to see Gillian McAllister's Wrong Place Wrong Time chosen as a Reese Witherspoon pick because that is something that is a crime slash thriller novel but it takes the genre and it you know it breaks apart the parameters of it and that's what I love to read and so I totally understand when readers are just like I want a straightforward crime novel or thriller that does exactly what I expect it to do it's kind of like I see it a lot with romance novels as well that Mm -hmm. if you dare kind of break the uh, expected formula of a romance novel romance readers are not going to be happy with you because they are expecting a certain thing and I just find I think with American readers that expectation is more solidified I think like over here it's um it's more you know they, they'll kind of go with it a bit more but uh, I find American readers are like no I want this and if it's not that then you know they don't like it but all I can do all I can ever do is write the book that I want to read and I don't want to read standard you know same old same old I want something different every time and all I can do is try and produce that. Right. Well, I I think you're absolutely right. And the other thing that all of those, so we would hear, we would call these thrillers, right? The other thing that all the books that are coming out that fall into that category, the ones that you're talking about have in common is that the vast majority of them are not very good. And I think that, (laughs) I honestly think that we're seeing some backlash. I think that the American 
reading audiences is finally getting wise to the fact that Mm -hmm. we're these big, hugely hyped novels that come out. And then we're like, really another completely drunk female lead character who, you know what I mean? I know. Yeah. 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 And so, and, and so I think that's one reason why in currently reading, we've been really trying to use the distinction that you made. That was an eye opener for me, which is that in the UK, you guys call it crime fiction. And mm-hmm. you don't have this distinction that we have here, which is like mysteries or thrillers. We don't like we we basically say crime thriller like it's one one big thing, and it's always so funny then when people are like American readers are saying, you know, this is really this is like a suspense or this is like a mystery, and I'm like, I I genuinely I don't know what you mean, like because for us right. it's just one big one big catchall. Right. Right. And so this notion of like when people are like, oh, you know, did you have you seen the new thriller from Catherine Ryan Howard? I just want to say, wait, stop. That (laughs) that's not what she does. She's Mm -hmm. not writing for ding dongs. She's writing for, you know, people who want to think what not like think hard or it's not like Mm -hmm. a project, but it's just you're having to bring something to the reading. And when you do, you're going to meet us there. And that's what I really, really love about it. Like you care enough about the writing of it you're not just trying to meet a deadline and just say you know yeah and like I I love what you said there that like you know I think I've said that in the past that I do ask readers I think I've actually had a conversation (laughs) with my editor at one point (laughs) that went along these lines where they were kind of pushing for more explanation at at a point in a book maybe at the end of a book and I was like no like that's not me like the reader has to come meet me in the middle of the road um and then you see like I don't look at them anymore but back when I used to look at Goodreads reviews and stuff like that you know you'd see people saying like oh I I wanted to know why and like I wanted this explained and then the next review would be like she explained too much you know she was (laughs) so you just you can't win and the like the only thing you can do is write what you think honestly like I'm just repeating myself now but I genuinely think there's nothing else you can do as a writer except write the book that you want to read that you think is the best book you can produce out of that idea and sort of second guessing anything else is just it's not a recipe for long-term readership or success or anything that's absolutely true if you want to put out good books but apparently there are a lot of people that feel like they can just rinse and repeat once a year well what what I would say in their defense (laughs) In their defense, is that when you think of the biggest selling books in this genre, and when you think of the most popular TV shows, and when you think of the biggest bands, and when you think of the biggest box office movies, a lot of them are quite like middle of the road, like they're they're competent but they're not anything amazing. And I think that's because when something gets to a certain point of popularity, it's having to appeal to such a broad um, number of people that anything that's like a bit unusual or challenging or, you know, outside of the the standard, like it's just never going to have that kind of success. And I always use the example of the girl on the train, which like, you know, back then we didn't have a lot of drunken protagonist like it was a (laughs) she wasn't following anything at the time like I thought that was a good book but it's not the best thriller ever written and it has sold millions and millions and millions of copies and I always call I always use the example of my mother who prior to her daughter writing thrillers never read a thriller in her life and read The Girl on the Train and her mind was blown because she was discovering she liked thrillers it wasn't Mm -hmm. about the book itself so you know, I think in publishing as in all creative work, there's room for everyone. There's room for like every strata of originality and, you know, prose and, you know, not everyone is going to be like an award winning parameter breaking writer. There's right. a place for everyone. But what I would just love to see is more readers um, giving the unusual a chance. I think mm-hmm. that's how I would put it. Yeah. Do you ever worry? I'm that so you're... diplomatic, Meredith, aren't you I? Are... <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I you know, but I think I think I agree with with what you're saying. I just 
I just am so, I just, I'm so tired of, so, of the, the big hype around the mediocre book, but we'll set that aside because we want to talk about this book. So, oh boy, I lost my train of thought. Um, do you ever worry that your publisher is going to try to push you in a direction that you don't want to go? Like, is that, that's not a worry for you? No, because I, w- I wouldn't let them. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I like no, it. I, I think like my publisher knows what they have. <laughs> okay. And they're never going to tell me to, I, I mean, I can't see that happening. I think they're, they're happy enough to just let me off and, and do my thing. Like that's, that's what they knew they were getting. So I, I can't ever imagine. And like, certainly, you know, this is book six, like really it was only the nothing man where people started to pay attention and it was only 56 days where things really started to happen. And so there was plenty of times when I said to myself, like, am I trying too hard? Should I write some like dumb (laughs) locked room thing? Should I try and consider the market? Should I write the same book every time? Should I start a series? There was certainly moments where I had that doubt. And I always said to myself, you know, no, because like, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. I physically cannot do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the number one thing is that I have to be fulfilled and I have to be proud of my work. And so I kept doing my thing and it's worked out. Um, You know, it's, there's been a huge leap in the, in between the last two books. And so I feel validated that like I was right to do that and I'm just going to keep doing it. And I'm sure my publisher will be happy to let me. Good. <laughs> That's, that makes me feel so like, I can't even tell you how happy that will make everyone, <laughs> everyone who's watching this because we don't, you know, we, we want you to keep doing what you're doing. So one of the things that I got a lot of questions about or when I asked, I asked everyone what they wanted me to ask you is, and I have a, I have a few of these, this concept of a book a year, Mm -hmm. how hard is that? And what would happen if you did, you couldn't come up with a book in a year that you felt was going to meet the quality that you, that you wanted that book to be like, how much is that an issue? Um, if, if that happened, nothing would happen. Like your, your publisher would understand they're, they're not evil. Like that, you know, and they understand Good. it's a creative process. Like if, if it came to it and I said, look, lads, you know, I'm, I, I don't have anything. I need a break. I need, you know, a few months off. Then they like, they wouldn't be throwing me a party, but they'd be, <laughs> they'd be all right with it. Um, I am not down a mine. Like I am not, bagging groceries I'm not standing behind the front desk of a hotel like I used to dealing with people who forgot to bring their brains on vacation I am doing my dream job I get to get up in the morning I don't even have to get dressed and I make a coffee and I sit at my computer and I make stuff up like I'm delighted to be producing a book a year and I work best under pressure I don't do anything like if you tell me I have eight months to deadline, I'm watching Netflix. Like I'm not, I'm not writing anything. I need that, <laughs> that pressure. So like, it's just as well. I'm on a book a year or there'd be, there'd be no writing done at all. Like, cause I'm, we wouldn't get one. Writing. Right. We wouldn't get one. So for me, like, and also, you know, it's, it's not, um, very romantic to talk about this but like it pays the bills as well so I can't really afford to you know go down to well maybe soon I'll be able to say I'll give you one every two years but for now you know I don't want to do that I love this I love that by the time I get a book handed in I'm getting ready to promote the next one um you know I just love it like this is what I love to do and this is about as much as I can do it like I'm never gonna be able to write a book in like nine months or anything like that where you know some digital publishers seem to be on a six or a nine month schedule with books I'm a book a year like that's my that's my minimum so or my max so I love it like I I don't feel any um worry or concern or anything like that and I'm I'm sort of confident in the process that even if the first draft is absolute rubbish, which it nearly always is, that in the process, we'll get to where we need to be. I think it's very interesting to follow you on Instagram because you're such a great follow because we do have a sense of the fact that we're kind of going through the process with you. And there's periods of time where you do say like, 
oh, what I'm working on is crap, or I've just really, you know, yeah. or I really need to get started or right, you know, like those kinds of things. And it's really fun to follow that process with you. Now, what one thing that you just said may cue a question that I had, do you in any of your books, but especially in runtime, do you ever see yourself in a particular character? And I'm thinking, of course, of Adele in runtime, mm-hmm. because she works behind the desk of, of, a, of yeah. a hotel. So do you ever, <laughs> are you ever in any of your books? Um, I would not say that I am in the books. Um, you know, one of the old writing advice things is use uh, write what you know but I think you should use what you know so like going back to distress signals I had never been on a cruise ship I still haven't I never will go you never will uh, ever will but I I had worked as a housekeeping supervisor at a hotel in Walt Disney World so there's not much difference between professional housekeeping in a hotel and professional housekeeping on a cruise ship so I used that for one of the characters just to lend it some like authenticity. Um, so there's all little things in books, hotels keep popping up because I didn't have that many jobs before <laughs> I started <laughs> doing this. Not many interesting ones anyway. So there's lots of people who like work in hotels and call centers and things like that. But what I will say about runtime is what the book is really about, I think, is the dangers of wanting something too much. Like I wanted this since I was a child um, and I shudder to think where I would be or how I would be if it hadn't happened. Um, Lucky, you know, for me, it all worked out. But I wanted to write about someone who was the same, who desperately wanted this thing that they really have no control over because in any sort of creative industry, you're dependent on other people to say yes and to, you know, employ you and give you a chance and, give you the part and publish your book and all this kind of thing so Adele certainly is that she's like a sort of version of me that didn't get what she wanted and I I, you know I have friends who want to be writers and you know for some of them it will just not happen because it can't happen for everyone that's not how dreams work and I remember like a friend saying to me years ago you know I, I don't know how to stop wanting this And like, I thought that was, you know, a special kind of torture that you you can't just turn off wanting this thing. So in terms of like themes and how she thinks and where she is in her life and stuff, like that's where it came from. But I don't put myself into into the books. Knowingly, I don't anyway. Maybe I do subconsciously. (laughs) Right. Well, I just kept thinking about Adele, but really along the lines of exactly what you just said, the book is very much about when you, when you really, really want something and the, you know, what can happen when you get it and what can happen when you don't. And that, and this is something, you know, your, your desire to be an award-winning and best-selling writer had to have been. I'm sorry. I'm I'm reading the comments and someone just said, I feel like I'm getting a therapy session, (laughs) (laughs) which I love. I love. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. You can Venmo (laughs) us later. Um, so yeah, yeah. That, you know, it just, had to have been something that you, that you experienced too, because if yeah. you don't really want something, you don't work like you can't work as hard as you have to get it unless you really, really wanted it. So you've said before that you'll never write a series. And I'm assuming that's still where we are where you're never, we're you, still there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How, you, you've also said before that you, your books are not series at all because you, you can't literally cannot be paid to write a series, but yeah. you sort of set them in similar worlds yeah runtime is not necessarily we're not in Dublin in runtime yeah right so it's not we're not set in that exact same place is there any overlap did you is there any so so for me all the books take place in the same universe in the same fictional universe so the one thing that I had a really little evil cackle about in runtime is that one of Adele's friends was in the series of The Liar's Girl. But in the book, that's a true crime series because that really happened. Like the canal killer was a real murderer. Um, and that's that's how I see the books. Like everything, the world in which runtime takes place and 56 Days takes place is the same world where there was a serial killer called Nothing Man. You know, I, I build it that way. Um, but Ireland is a really small place. So like, it's very, it's very hard to keep moving things around. And like the next book is kind of in sort of indiscriminate 
Dublin area. So yeah, there's there's overlaps, but it's in terms of the real world events. Like I don't usually bring people back. Um, this is a really, really like deep, deep Easter egg, but there is something at the back of runtime. It's the last page in the book. If you are the type of person who reads the acknowledgements first, please note they're at the front of the book. Because if you see that thing at the back of the book, you will spoil every single reveal for you. But that article is signed like as written by Audrey Coughlin, who is Audrey from Rewind. So she's still writing entertainment news. God love her. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. I got all of that. And I was just like evil cackle. Exactly. Yeah. Like it was so, so, so good. I absolutely, I absolutely love it. So let's talk a little bit. And and just in case anyone is wondering, I am definitely going to pressure her for details on the next book. Don't worry. That is coming. I know that they're all like, Meredith, she said something twice about her new book and yet you're not following Don't worry, up. and I, I will give those details up so you can all relax. We will get to that. <laughs> we are not going to let her go without, without getting to that. But let's talk a little bit about the two covers because this is another topic that comes mm. up all the time. You know, a lot of us American readers are buying from Blackwell's because we can get the gorgeous UK covers now and we don't have to wait forever to do it. Tell me about how the two because the covers are very different mm. they're very very different so do you have a preference and tell me a little bit about the process getting to those covers I think that's so funny because I always prefer the U.S. covers and I order books <laughs> from the U.S. so I don't <laughs> you can't go with um, okay, so the main thing is we are talking about two different planets. We're talking about two different markets. We're talking about two different publishing houses. My US publisher doesn't really look at what my UK publisher is doing and, and, and vice versa in terms of covers. So like that that in its like to me, the question of why are they different is is just not even a thing because, you're just talking about two entirely different places. If you look at French covers, if you look at Italian covers, if you look at Estonian covers, I'm weirdly published in Estonia. Like, I mean, you should go look at the Estonian covers because they are a trip, but the <laughs> <laughs> there's something else. Uh, but it's everything is just different. It's just different in the same way that everything in each country is different. Um, so that's why they're different. Um, I, I sort of do have an input, like m with my American publisher, they're very, you know, they will show me like a lot of concepts and I'll kind of get to say what I like and what I don't. Whereas in the UK, I'm more kind of shown and, you know, they'll say like the famous publishing line is everyone in the office really likes it. They'll tell you oh. that about everything, which is just code for Be we're quiet. not going back to. <laughs> <laughs> so but my attitude is like I'm a writer I'm not a cover designer and these are designed by absolute experts who you know know way more about marketing and selling books and everything else um and my eyeshadow is Charlotte Tilbury I need to stop looking at the <laughs> get out of the chat Catherine get out of the chat um but, for, but so I really don't like ultimately the covers are not, you know, they're not up to me. Um, and that and that's how it should be. I'm not a cover designer. And I love I love both of them. Like, I really love I really love that. I just think that is fabulous. It's and I perfect. think it goes so well with 56 days. But that would not work over here. Like people would not buy this over here because it just doesn't it doesn't suit the market. It doesn't suit what all the other, what all the other books um, look like. Was there a second part to that question? I got distracted by the eyeshadow. Do you, right. well, I was wondering about your eyeshadow too, <laughs> but do you have a UK cover to hand right now? Like, do you I can get one? one. Well, I get, get one. Yeah. Yeah. Get one, That's yeah. Cause I think a lot of people probably haven't seen it. I was going to show everyone. And just as, as a special treat, I brought Estonia as well. Oh, good. Oh, wow. Look at that. 
<laughs> Wait, is that a child? Yeah. I don't even know what one that. Oh, that's the nothing man. Oh. Oh, look, he's, I don't know if you can see, but there's like a little man there. Oh. Anyways. Wow. That is a mood. I don't know where you went, but I wanted to show we've got beautiful so copies here. that's one of those pages that they sent me that I made a reel of signing like I have not actually touched that book I just touched that page <laughs> really? well it looks, yes. it looks great okay I'm going to duck out again but Catherine I, I said I love how you do your one sentence synopses of your book so can you do that for us for this do you have one, oh, yeah. one sentence synopses you, my no. one for this is that it's set on the set of a horror movie where the events in the script start to happen on the set that's my okay. <laughs> that's it. my one line love it okay I'm ducking out so do you have so right so you yeah. know very very different do you, one question that we got in the in the chat was do you come up with the title is it your title um I'm not good at titles so I I usually don't come up with the title runtime I have a friend called Hazel Gaynor who writes historical fiction and is a title generator like she will just come up with you know so many good ideas and I think she came up with running time and then I I I came up it's like saying you know <laughs> Right, you I came yeah, up with the wrong bit, yeah. Right. Um, and she came up with fifty six days. Um, and the nothing man came from a friend who suggested that being the name for a serial killer. So I don't really like for my next book. Um, I have absolutely no idea what to call it. And basically, somewhere not right now because it's quarter to two in the morning, but somewhere tomorrow, people will be in an office at my publishers like coming up with a list of of things to tell me and I'll get to pick one basically um okay. so you, every, you everything you choose it. yeah but like everything that isn't actually writing the book is is sort of done by the publishers and you may have a lot of input you may not they're never going to do something you absolutely hate hopefully like they're not going to try and you know you're a partner in this but for me, the longer I'm in this, because like when I published my debut, I was an absolute nightmare. Like I was just, I wanted to micromanage everything. I wanted to approve everything. I thought I knew everything. But you are a focus group of one. You're mm. a writer. You're not a publisher. And so now in my grand old age of six books, I'm more like sit back and relax and I will be guided by them because they're the experts. Right, which I think is 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 really really smart for sure. So, okay, for this book, did you outline runtime or did you plot as you went? Because I know you like to trick us. You like to make sure that we're yeah not getting it too soon. I did both. So, like, what I kind of do now is I will before I write anything, I will plot, but I will only plot out like the major things that are going to happen. So, like, I'll have something a third of the way in half of the way and then like the ending and I'll know that but when I start to write like anything anything could happen and like this book changed a lot so the first draft of this book was written in the third person whereas actually the finished book is in the first person um so there was a lot of kind of little changes along the way but usually this the superstructure of the plot always remains the same because I decide on that at the beginning okay Okay, that definitely makes sense. So do you ever, re I think I know the answer to this. Do you ever read your own books like the finished copy, like a reader would read it? Do you, have you ever done that? Um, I have reread some of them. Usually if like something's coming up and I need to be reminded of what they're about <laughs> and what people's <laughs> names are and stuff, because <laughs> you just completely forget it. Um, I remember reading The Liar's Girl, I would say a year ago, and I was like, this is pretty good. <laughs> you know, like you forget, like I had forgotten most of it and I was well impressed that myself on my second book had written like some of the stuff I was reading, but you can't, you can't ever read it as a reader. And that's why like the editorial process is so important because mm -hmm. I, I'm never, unless I'm in a horrible accident, I'm never going to completely forget 
the book but like I do remember that time reading The Liar's Girl because I did have half of it forgotten so maybe in 10 years time I'll be able to read them that way but when when the finished copies arrive like today when the American ones arrived you are so sick of looking at that goddamn Mm -hmm. book and you have read it probably 50 times during the editorial process you don't want to see it anymore so you're not you're not sitting down on the couch to have a nice flick through (laughs) yeah you're not reading runtime right now now but now you have to go and do all this PR yeah how much I mean is that I know you're not gonna tell us you're not gonna tell us the truth about this but do you get sick of talk because people we're all gonna ask you the same questions right yeah no like I don't get sick of it I really don't because like first of all I'm not at that level where like I'm doing it like I'm you know there's authors who are have to go on a book tour and they literally are doing the same thing every night for a month Mm -hmm. like maybe if I get to that level I'll be like I don't want to talk about this anymore but like Mm -hmm. this is my favorite subject not me but like writing and books and ideas and storytelling and like I just I love the fact that people are in any way interested and if ever I catch myself complaining about having to do something or like you know I was saying about the signed books like they sent me a a thousand pages (laughs) to sign my name on and I was like oh you know I have so many of them to do and then I was like cop yourself on as we say in Ireland like this is your dream job and you're so lucky that you get to do it and stop complaining so I, I really I really enjoy it like this is the fun bit because you get to see people <laughs> you get right. to see the outside world right. and you get to wear nice dresses and actually put makeup on um thanks for noticing and <laughs> you know I spend the, I spend 50 weeks of the year in my pajamas with like coffee stains down my top so this is the fun bit you like that part would you like so two two other questions that kind of in the, around this this area do you, would you like it if your publishers came to you and said, we're going to, now that you have all these great books, we're going to release them all. And you know how they do this sometimes they release them all with kind of similar covers. Would you like that? Or are you like, "Eh, I'm not interested. So I think my UK publisher might, might be thinking of doing that because the first three um, UK covers are very different. Like they just have no relationship to the last three, which are all in this red, black and white palette. Mm -hmm. So they might do that. And like, you know, there's, there's good reasons to do that, which is that, you know, visually they will match the more popular books, obviously, and hopefully help people discover the earlier ones. Um, like I think my American I really love like my American covers I can't see them getting any sort of holy branded thing but like if that honestly the honest answer is if your publisher comes to you and says we want to rebrand your covers that means you are on the special child favorite list of your publishers and they're Mm -hmm. they're doing really good work for you so that's a very good thing (laughs) so it would be a really you'd be super happy about it oh yeah yeah I would love it because I would love to have a whole matching set. So if you could well, speak I, to them about that. Well, I was that. just talking about this to someone this morning. We were, we were talking about when you're following an author for years and years and then their bloody publisher changes the branding and the new book doesn't match your other book. And I was telling them a story about years ago, I used to have a blog, like I think it was probably 2010, 2011 about writing, but I would talk about books as well occasionally and I was big into Yo Nesbo I had just discovered him and I had like six or seven paperbacks and they all matched and then the new book comes out and it's a totally different design and I am raging and I blogged about it very tongue-in-cheek but I was upset and Vintage Books emailed me and said can we have your address and they sent me an entire matching set of oh, wow. the books for my bookshelf so wow. All right, I'm gonna keep that trick in my back my back pocket for sure. You you email Blackstone and you'll get it. <laughs> when they do that, that will be yeah. awesome. Do you think any of your books will would you want any of your books? And if so, which one to be made into a movie or even better yet, a series? So there is stuff happening on that front, but I can't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um yeah (laughs) sign language is sign language possible can we do charades I will just say that um like it's everyone's favorite book and well not your favorite book because you're a weirdo Meredith compared to everyone 
<laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I love it. Love it. It's love most it. people's favorite book and also the most popular book and stuff is going on with both of them. But I've had, there's only one of my books that's never been optioned. Like things get optioned all the time. Mm. And then, you know, like I describe it as having a ticket for the lotto. You have a better chance of winning the jackpot than someone who doesn't have a ticket, Mm -hmm. but your chances are about the same. Like the odds are really against you that it will actually get made. I would love to see it happen. Um, mainly because it would be great publicity for my books. Like my books are absolutely my priority Mm. and anything else that happens is, is just a bonus, but hopefully like eventually something will end up on screen if only so my brother can have a part in it and <laughs> which would be so much fun that would be so much yeah. fun all right so I want to be sure that we save some time to ask a couple of things that there's no question people want want to know about when you last did the conversation with fabled you were so good to give us some of your favorite crime fiction writers mm-hmm. Liz Nugent being top of that list for me because then we went and started reading and started reading, you know, so much good stuff there. So yes. what is your either most recent favorite read? I know that you, you probably can't read that much while you're in the, you know, the, the writing yes. process and you probably don't read crime fiction when you're doing that, but you're, you know, any other kind of great five-star reads in the crime fiction realm that you think we should know about? I was afraid you were going to ask me this because I have had such a terrible year of reading um, because I've been so busy. Like there's just been so much going on. So my number one book of the year, and I cannot see it being topped. And it was so good. It made me want to give up writing because I was like, I could just never write a book this good is Notes on an Execution. Okay. Um, Dania is the first name. Um I'm sure our lovely bookseller will get, will get her last name. Kafka. The Kafka. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. I thought that was exquisite. And, and it was a book that like really crept up on me as well, because when I started reading it, it felt like, oh, this is what I expected. This is what I was anticipating. You know, it's like a literary crime novel. Um, essentially, there's a, a killer on death row. And as he counts down to his execution, you find out how he got there, but you find out through the women who were in his life. And as the book went on, I was just like, I just couldn't believe how good it was. And I was in tears at the end. And I never cry at books, least of all books about killers on death row. Um, I thought it was fantastic. It was so good. It annoyed me because I was like, You're like I'm I, should, done. I shouldn't have read this while I was writing a book, but um, that would be, I keep a list on my phone. So let me just have a quick look to see if there's anything else, but that's like, I don't think anything else came close to that this year, but let me, I have so many good ones lined up for my holidays in a few weeks. Oh my gosh. It must um, be- These Women by Ivy uh, Pachoda. I don't, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. That was also excellent. There's a book that's just out called Dirt Town by Haley Scrivener, which I believe is Dirt Creek Dirt in Creek. the US. Yes. Yeah, I thought that was absolutely excellent. And um, I'll give you one more because it's not out until next year. And it's Death of a Bookseller by Alice Slater, which is, if you liked you, it's like that, but it's in Britain. It's set in a London bookshop and it features a true crime obsessive and it is fabulous. I, I happen to know Alice Little and I got like one of the first 10 proofs that were sent out to people and I just thought it was fantastic. But alas, you will have to wait until next year for that. But Dirk Creek and No Son and Execution in the meantime. All right, perfect. Both of those are on my TBR and I am going to move them way, way up now that you've said this. Yeah. So, okay. We need to talk about the next book. Yeah. Right. So other than your eyeshadow, the number one thing that everyone wants to know about. So eyeshadow is Charlotte Tilbury, right? We know that. Yeah. It's the walk of shame palette or no walk of shame. I think it's called because people complained when it was called walk of shame. So (laughs) no walk of shame. There's no no shame. shame. That's what it is. Walk of no shame. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the next book. It's coming out next August. Yeah. Well, I don't know. So there's going to be some news in a couple of weeks. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. 
um yeah basically i'm chained like this is it's hardly an exclusive because i'm telling everyone but in a couple of weeks there will be an announcement i'm changing uk publishers um mm-hmm. i'm moving so when that comes out we'll know more about like when the book will be published but i presume i'll still be in the summer my us publisher remains the same and you can actually read the first chapter of the book because last week I had a new short story in the Irish Times here in Ireland and it is essentially the opening scene of the next book. Oh, okay. And that's in, that was in the Irish Times? The Irish Times, yeah, yeah. Okay, so do you have a do you have you written enough to give us a one sentence synopsis of it? No, but no. like what I would say is, you know, in the 90s, we had what we call the vanishing triangle here in Ireland, where a number of women, I think the unofficial tally is nine, went missing, um, like snatched off roads in the middle of the night. We think a few of them were uh, murdered by the same man. No one has ever been charged. No trace of them has ever been found. And here we are decades later. And that's what dominated the headlines when I was a teenager. So when I was like starting to pay attention to the news, what I'm hearing is women are literally being snatched up into the night and no one can find them and really, you know, no one's looking for them. And that's the jumping off point for this. So it kind of takes a case like that and it puts it in the present day but the center, the main character is the sister of one of the missing women. And she is just refusing to sit back and, and wait for answers. She's going to go out and get answers herself. So ask me again in a few months and I might have my one sentence, but it's it's a lot more back to like nothing man territory. It's um, very serious and I'm hoping it will be really emotional and it has an unusual structure of course so (laughs) guess what it's not linear right right (laughs) (laughs) so um that's what it's going to be but uh, look out for an announcement in a couple of weeks time that sounds so good I absolutely cannot wait that's going to be that's going to be wonderful (laughs) I'm so excited I'm joking (laughs) I'm so I'm so happy don't get about it. don't get too excited right no I I am so that is excellent and Catherine this has been such a privilege Kate and such a joy to be able to ask you all these questions that I think you're thinking about all the time so thank you so so much for talking for talking with me about the for runtime and everybody seriously I, I think we could do this like every night this week and we wouldn't run out of things to talk about <laughs> I literally I've only asked you a third of what I had here so if you want to get together tomorrow night at 2 a.m I'm available but yes I I love runtime and I am so excited to see I'm so glad it's finally going to be in people's hands over here in the U.S. thank you so much and, and thank you. You get the prize for uh, two o'clock in the morning talking to you <laughs> and girls. So um, just so thank you so much. We just wish you the very best this week and uh, throughout the buying process for all of all of your U.S. Um, readers. And thank you, Meredith. I just love listening to you guys talk and we'll see you next month. All right. Our- Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.